everyone. Welcome to Saddleback. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Now, whether you're a first time guest or a long time member, you're in for a treat. We'll experience uplifting and encouraging music and inspiring relevant message from God's word with thousands and thousands of people from all over the world. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. As we continue, let's see how God is using the family of Saddleback to channel his love during these difficult times. Take a look. Hey Saddleback family, my name is Tylin, and this week we have a couple of inspiring stories to share with you. Even in the midst of pain and uncertainty, God is using the church to help those who are hurting. We were made to go through life together, especially during difficult seasons. This has been tough for people who have recently lost loved ones or may feel isolated and alone because of the pandemic. Melanie Ennerline, our Saddleback Newport Mesa worship leader, made it her mission to distance visit and lead hurting people in her community through song and prayer. Thank you so much for being with us today, Mel. Tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea of visiting other people. In our staff, we've been talking about thinking of creative ways to be able to meet people's needs. And so I was at home one day and just kind of sparked this idea of what if we came to their door and sang them a song, prayed with them, encouraged them. We had heard a lot about people who were grieving and had lost loved ones. And it was just so heartbreaking to hear that they can't hold a memorial service right now. So we were just thinking of a way to bring hope and encouragement to them. I know this experience is deeply impacting those you visit, including a couple who lost a family member to COVID-19 and even a man who lost his mother in a car accident during this time. Tell us a little bit about their stories and your visits with them. No matter who was around, a lot of them just raised their hands up and as tears were coming down, it was just such a vulnerable moment, but just so beautiful to see their response and, pr and, and praise and just hearing them go through their hard time, but yet still knowing God's in control. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mel. Of course, thank you. Another way Saddleback is helping those who are hurting is by providing food to those who are struggling financially. Last week, volunteers from across our Saddleback campuses teamed up to host our largest pop-up grocery distribution ever. We had the opportunity to feed almost 700 families that showed up to Savannah High School in the city of Anaheim and tell them about why we still have hope. Principal Mike Pooley and the school's community liaison, Maria Trujillo, gave us an update on how crucial Saddleback's grocery distribution ministry is during this time. This is a blessing. I mean, Saddleback reaching out to us. We did this two weeks ago and um, served over 600 families. And it was just tremendous. And we had the opportunity to do it again. The smiles on their faces, you know, the gratitude that the, the, this community has for others to, to jump in and support is just tremendous. The vibe that you have brought is like just so authentic and like you feel it. You feel the love, you feel the compassion. It's just been great to see how that interaction affects our parents in such a positive way. So thank you so much. Thanks for letting us tell you about just a few of the ways our church is shining light in the darkness. We'll be back next week with more encouraging stories. You know, there's nothing that excites us more than change lives. Thank you for your prayers and your support in making that happen. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, listen to what Psalm 150 says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him in his mighty deeds. Praise him in his excellence. Praise the Lord with loud cymbals. Praise the Lord with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love. His love for me, who the sun sets free, all is free.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, author of The Purpose Driven Life, and teacher on the Daily Hope broadcast. Now, if I look a little different this week, it's because I'm wearing my reading glasses. I simply forgot to bring my regular glasses out here to my farm. And yes, this is my farm. It's not a blue screen or a green screen. Now, for the past 10 weeks, I've been teaching a series on principles for living through a pandemic. While the health professionals have been working on preventing the disease, I've been trying to help you navigate the dis-ease that this pandemic has created in your life. Just think of all the changes you've had to go through since this thing started. And it's created a lot of stress in your life or dis-ease in our lives. And as a pastor, my job is to help you survive it and help you even thrive in this pandemic. So each week, uh, we've been looking at an emotional side effect of this COVID-19 crisis, like anxiety and loneliness and frustration and anger and depression and grief. And we've looked at impatience. Now, if you've missed any of the first 10 messages in this series, you can go online to saddleback.com and you can download the teaching outlines and you can watch the videos. Now, if you haven't downloaded today's outline uh, yet, I think you should pause this webcast and go ahead and download it right now because I'm going to share with you a boatload of ideas that you're going to forget otherwise. Now, our text for this series is a very small five-chapter book in the Bible called the book of James. It's only 108 verses, but it is so packed with with wisdom that it took us nine weeks just to get through the first chapter. (laughs) It's got a lot in it. And uh, I have told you that the book of James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, okay? Uh, Mary and Joseph were his dad. Mary was just Jesus' mother, but Joseph wasn't his dad. But he became the leader, James did, became the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. And by the way, he was one of the first Christian martyrs to die for his faith. But James is kind of like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament part of the Bible. Uh, It's what's called wisdom literature which means that it gives practical advice for living. And that's why I chose it during this COVID-19 crisis. It also means that the topic often changes in a wisdom book very quickly, like from verse to verse. One verse has nothing to do with the next verse, has nothing to do with the next verse. So we kind of skip around in it because a lot of times he'll repeat multiple themes in different parts of the book. But if there was a theme to this book of James, it is the idea that what you claim to believe is actually worthless. What you claim to believe is worthless if it doesn't translate into action. This book, the book of James, is about showing your faith by doing something, actually doing something. It's all about doing. Uh, This is a book filled with verbs, action words, actions and activities that we're to do, not just in a crisis or pandemic, but literally all the time. Now, probably the two most important theme verses in uh, the book of James are these first two verses that are there on your outline. James 1.22 says this, don't fall into self-deception, okay? Don't deceive yourself. Don't fall into self-deception by merely listening to God's word and thinking you've got it. No, do what it says. Be a doer of the word. So James is saying that don't, you don't just go out and do a Bible study or you don't just go to church and let God's word go in one ear and not come out of the other ear. He says, you're just fooling yourself. You're kidding yourself. You're, you're, you're in self-deception. He said, if you hear the word of God and you don't do anything about it, you're just kidding yourself. Nothing really changes in your life. He says, you gotta put God's word into practice. You have to act on it if you're gonna get any benefit Uh, or any good out of this book. You gotta act on it. Your beliefs must be turned into behavior. Your convictions uh, must be converted into conduct. And for you to be blessed by the Bible, the principles have to be translated into your performance, your day-to-day activity. Now, the other verse uh, that we uh, will look at in detail in the future, I can hear the horses over there. The other verse we'll hear in detail in a future session is James chapter 2, verse 14. And it says this in the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you've got faith if you don't prove it by your actions? 
He says that kind of faith can't save anybody. In other words, he says if you're going to walk the talk the talk, you, you, you got to walk the walk. What you profess you believe, you must practice in your life. So today, uh, this message is going to be a little bit different uh, than all the ones we've looked at previously in the first 10, uh, because we're only going to consider one verse from the book of James. But man, what a verse it is. And it's a pretty straightforward verse. Doesn't need any interpretation. Doesn't need any explanation. It's just something we need to start doing every single day of this pandemic. You see, let me just be honest with you. The truth is, all of us know far more to do good than we're doing. We, our knowledge far exceeds our actions. The problem in our lives, the lives of most Christian believers, followers of Jesus, it's not a lack of knowledge. We already know more than we're doing. It's a lack of practical action. So today's message is literally going to be filled with practical suggestions on how to do what God tells us to do in, is the second most important thing in all of life to do. Now, the one verse we're going to look at is James chapter 1, verse 8. And here's what it says. This royal law, the one he's about to give us, this royal law is found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you obey this law, you're doing right. That's it. That's it. For the rest of my time with you, I want to talk about how to do that. I want to talk about putting that in action. How are you going to love your neighbor as yourself in a pandemic? Now, of course, James is quoting what's called the great commandment of Jesus, his half-brother. One day, the Bible says a man came up to Jesus and he asked a question. And in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, it says this. A man asked Jesus, of all the commandments of God, which is the most important? And Jesus says this, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's the number one commandment in life. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, now the second commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, there is no greater commandment, no commandment greater than these. Now notice he moves from first person uh, singular to second person singular. There's no greater commandment than these. Well, what is it? One or two? God says they go together. You can't love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength if you don't love your neighbors yourself. And you can't love your neighbors yourself if you don't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. So God considers them one commandment. There's two parts. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. But that story that I just read to you, it's not the only place in the Bible that this command, love your neighbor as yourself, is found. No, 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 no. This command, love your neighbor as yourself, it's called the royal law of Scripture, is repeated not once, not twice, not three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. It's repeated nine times in the Bible. You must love your neighbor as yourself. It's like God saying, come on, people. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to forget this. This is the top thing to do. Love me and love everybody else. Don't miss this. Don't forget this. Don't ignore this. Don't minimize this. Next to me, loving me as God, this is the second most important thing I put you on earth to learn. How to love your neighbors yourself. Whoa, so I don't need to explain that. I don't need to interpret it. You just need to love your neighbors yourself this next week. How are you going to do that? You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that without love, nothing else matters. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 4 that love shows that we really know God, that if we don't love our neighbor, we don't really know God. The Bible tells us that to love God and to other people is our number one responsibility on earth. So what's love? You know, it's a very overused, a very misunderstood word. Two of the most popular misconceptions about love is, number one, a lot of people think love is a feeling. No, it's not. Love creates feelings. 
But love is not a feeling because you can't command a feeling. I command you to be happy. I'm trying, mommy. It doesn't work. You can't command a feeling. A lot of people think, though, love is a sentimental knot in your stomach. It's an ocean of emotion. It's a quiver in your liver. Uh, it's goosebumps. But you know what? Feelings are fickle. And if you get married on what you think you think is love and it's just a feeling, well, feelings come and go. I mean, if I were to ask you, how many of you always feel loving toward your spouse? Well, nobody could raise their hand on that one. Love is far more than a feeling. The other thing that people mistake is the myth that love is uncontrollable. And even the language we use about love, we say, well, you know, I, I fell into love like it was a ditch. <clears throat> you know, I just fell into love. Like I, uh, people assume that love cannot be controlled. And they say, you know, I just couldn't help myself. I'm in love with her. Well, that's a myth. Or I can't help it, I just don't love him anymore. Love is a choice, okay? It's not a feeling and it's not uncontrollable. What God says when he talks about love, and of course God is the source of all love, God is love, God says two things about love. Number one, love is a choice. Colossians chapter three, verse 14 says, put on love. It's just like getting dressed. You do have a choice what shirt or blouse or pants or dress or whatever you put on. Love is a choice. You choose to love people and you choose not to love other people. <laughs> you know, when I was dating Kay and the first time I asked her, why won't you marry me? Is there somebody else? She replied, well, there has to be. <laughs> you know, she, she had a choice. She, there has to be. Love is a choice. Number two, love is an action. Love is something you do. And that comes back to this book about be doers of the word, not hearers only. 1 John 3.18 says, let us not just love with words, but love with actions. It's like the guy who was dating his girlfriend and he, he said, oh, you know, I die for you, my love. And she said, oh, Bill, you're always saying that, but you never do it. You know, love is something you do. Love is more than a thought and love is more than a feeling. Otherwise, God couldn't command it. It's a choice. Now, the question for today is how? How? How can I love my neighbor during a COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, especially when we're supposed to be socially distancing, wearing masks and staying six feet apart. And you know, how, how can I love my neighbor during a pandemic? Well, for the rest of this message, I wanna be very practical. You know, I asked people in our church this week, how specifically are you showing love to your neighbors during this COVID-19? And it was amazing. I, I, I've got here like five pages. Uh, I wanna share, I'm not gonna share all these, but it's 50 ways. You know, do you remember the old Paul uh, Simon song, 50 ways to leave your lover? Well, this is 50 ways to love your neighbor, okay? Not lose your liver, but love your neighbor. And the answers I got back showed incredibly amazing innovation and creativity and spontaneity that, I, spontaneity that I've come to expect in the members of Saddleback Church. Now from their answers, and I've got five or six pages of them, I want to suggest five broad categories, practical categories, a way that you can love your neighbors yourself. I would highly recommend you get a pencil right now and write these down, why? Because it's the second most thing you're supposed to do with your life most important thing. Love God and love your neighbors yourself. So how do you do that? How do you get to know, uh, how do you love your neighbors yourself? All right, let's talk about them. Five ways. Number one, write this down. Get to know my neighbors individually. You can't love somebody you don't know. Get to know my neighbors individually. You know, after traveling around the world, I think I've been in 164 countries, I have realized how different and actually how odd America really is. Because everywhere else in the world, everybody knows their neighbors. But in America, uh, particularly in the suburbs, uh, people don't care about their neighbors. They don't even know their neighbors. We have a thing called garage door openers. So you can come home, open the garage door and drive right into your house and not talk to anybody. My guess is you don't know everybody on your street. That's a purely American uh, 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 mentality. Uh, if you live in a suburban area, people live next to people for years and never know a thing about them. So the starting point, if you're gonna love your neighbors yourself, you gotta get to know them personally. 
Now let me show you some Bible verses. Proverbs 18, 24, King James Version. To have friends, a man must show himself friendly. Duh, okay? You, you just gotta start being friendly with people. Romans 12, 16 in the CEV version. Be friendly with everyone. That's what the Bible says. Be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud. Don't feel you're smarter than everybody else, any others. Make friends with ordinary people. You wanna be a follower of Jesus? You need to learn how to be friendly. You need how to make friends with ordinary people. Did you know that God enjoys watching the people he created have fellowship with each other? Did you know that? God loves to watch people having fun and fellowshipping with each other. An example of that in Zechariah 3.10, God's talking about the day to come and he says, each of you, listen to this, Zechariah 3.10, each of you will invite your neighbor to come and enjoy peace and security in the shade of your vineyards and trees. Now, you probably don't have vineyards in your backyard, but you might have a tree uh, in your apartment area or wherever. And, and what he's saying there is he's saying, you know, it's gonna be fun when you hang out with your neighbors outside and you relax and you sit in the shade and you enjoy each other's company. Did you know that's in the Bible? It's in the Bible. God enjoys watching his people have fellowship with other people that he created. You know, one time Paul, the Apostle Paul, was shipwrecked, and the ship fell apart, and he floated ashore on a piece of driftwood to the island of Malta. In Acts chapter 28, verse 2, it says this, the neighbors went out, this is in Malta, the neighbors went out of their way to be friendly to us. That's what Paul says. He said it was cold and it was raining, so they built the fire right there on the beach, and they made us all feel welcome. Are you that kind of a neighbor? Do you go out of your way to make your neighbors feel welcome? Here's the first step to love your neighbors yourself. You gotta get to know your neighbor. Now, how do you do that? Well, let me just read you some of the ways that I ask people. How do you get to know your neighbor? One says, if you have a front porch or deck or area, just go out and sit there while people might be walking. Do you realize more people are walking today than at any other time in our history? Everybody's at home these days. Your neighbors are more at home right now than at any other time. And they're getting cabin fever from this pandemic. And they're out walking and they're walking their dog. Well, just if you go out and sit in your front yard, you'll meet people. So that's a good suggestion. Here's one. I planned a yard project, one guy said, so I could have, and I could have finished it quickly. But instead, I stretched it out over several days so I could be seen present and friendly in my neighborhood. Smart man. Another person says, I just walk around the neighborhood. Everybody's walking these days, tons of people. We go to the dog park and we see more people there who have plenty of time to talk. Said, I, if I see a neighbor outside, one person said, I walk up to about six feet of, of them and I start talking to them. One said, we dropped off board games at our neighbor's home just to get to know them. Another person wrote, we did a mini campfire out in front making s'mores in front of our uh, apartment. Here's another one said, we invited our neighbors over for a barbecue. Um, uh, one wrote, we've been meeting a lot of neighbors just by walking the dog and chatting with them. Said, since you're wearing a mask, don't wear sunglasses so they can at least see your eyes. That's smart. All right. Here's a, one guy said, we brought our barbecue to the front yard. We have a weekly burger night for anybody in our neighborhood once a week. Smart. Here's a guy who said, we passed out lemons from our tree to all our neighbors. Another guy said, we passed out avocados from our tree to all our neighbors. There's a woman named Sue. She said, I stopped jogging and I started walking during this pandemic so I could interact with other people during the crisis. Another guy said, I no longer go out with my earbuds or earphones. Smart. Nothing says, don't talk to me, leave me alone. It's like wearing earbuds. So don't, this is not the time to be wearing your earbuds outside. Another wrote, instead of walking around the block where I never encountered anybody, I've started walking around our apartment complex. And instead, and just smile and say hi to my people. These are ways to get to know your people. Another guy wrote, I started skateboarding at the local basketball court. I've had a lot of chats with people who just walking by heckling my skating. 
But just getting outside where people are open up to conversations make any, many of them turn to spiritual. Here's a woman who said, I started a book, jigsaw puzzle, and movie DVD sharing club for our neighborhood. Getting to know people. All right, here's another. I get out my guitar and I sit in a chair in my front yard. It always attracts some neighbors to meet and to talk. And on and on and on. I could just read more and more of these. Here's one. One guy wrote, Pastor Rick, our church should buy our own ice cream truck before summer and then play Saddleback worship songs as we go through the community. <laughs> so the first point is get to know my neighbors personally. You can't love them if you don't know them. Number two, here's the second way. Encourage my neighbors continually. Get to know my neighbors personally. Number two, encourage my neighbors continually. Did you know what? Everybody needs encouragement, especially now. Proverbs 12, verse 25 says this, worry weighs a person down, but an encouraging word cheers a person up. Everybody's worried right now. So everybody needs an encouraging word. By the way, one of the ways to encourage people uh, is to give a, an encouraging Bible verse to your neighbors. Now, you could find one on your own if you want to, or we'll make a list for you in, of encouraging Bible verses to share with your neighbor and you send it out to you at Saddleback at Home newsletter. Why would we do that? Well, Romans 15, 4 says this. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Everybody needs hope right now. And where do you get hope? From scriptures. Where do you get encouragement? From scriptures. The Bible says everything written in this book was written to encourage human beings. So share the scriptures with people and, and know three facts of life. Everybody you meet has a hurt. And it may be hidden, but it's a hurt. Number two, everybody gets discouraged and everybody needs a lift. Let me read you some of the ideas here that people are using to encourage people. Uh, here's one. I wrote a letter and put my picture on it and sent it to the 10 closest neighbors in our apartment, letting them know that I'd be barbecuing some burgers and hot dogs in a community barbecue, and they all came. That's just an encouragement. All right, here's another one. My kids have been leaving encouraging notes and pictures on the sidewalk with chalk. That's cool. All right. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I shared the oranges off my tree. I also made masks with my neighbors. Encouraging. All right. Here's one. Uh, we built a map of all the names and the birthdays on our street and gave it to everybody so everybody can celebrate each other. Encouragement. All right. Uh, here's the guy who said, we ordered a shave, a special ordered a shave ice truck to pass through our neighborhood, courtesy of Saddleback Church. They paid for it. And he said, it's not that expensive and our neighbors love the gift. They're just encouraging the people in their neighborhood. Here, a guy named David wrote, my wife and I play volleyball without a net outside our apartment complex. And we've met four different neighbors that we had met just by doing that. Another one said, we, we dropped off some colored verse pages to neighbors who needed the encouragement. Another wrote, I've been drawn encouraging Bible verses in chalk on my driveway many times since the pandemic started. And uh, here's another one. We did a driveway concert for our neighborhood, introduced some people to Jesus. Here's another. We left snack and a PDL, Purpose Driven Life book, for our mailman. And I told you about people getting out their guitars and doing stuff like that. Our kids, here's one, our kids paint rocks with scriptures on them and encouraging messages, and then we put them out for people to take. Here's a guy, he wrote, we cut fresh rosemary from a bush in our backyard, and we tied it in a bundle with a note with our contact info that if they needed prayer or needed someone to talk to, and, and we put it, on uh, all of our neighbor's front steps. Oh, great idea. Here's another encouragement. Uh, she wrote, we bought a pinata for the kids in our neighborhood. We bought a pinata. 
We've, we've met many neighbors by passing out fruits from our fruit trees. Here's one, uh, a woman says, I started a Facebook page for our neighborhood during the pandemic. And I post drive through events of Saddleback Church that we ha have as well as information about the food pantry that's available. Here's a woman who says, when I go grocery shopping, I intentionally wear my Saddleback shirt. It really causes me to strike up some great conversations with people and an opportunity to invite them online. Others painted things, signs that say God loves you on them, placed them uh, on the neighbor's front yards and said, everybody left them up. Said, we asked permission, but everybody just left them up. He said, my 80-year-old neighbor said he walked around the entire neighborhood just to read all the signs. You, you don't realize that people are open to spiritual truth right now. A high school volunteer in our church organizes a weekly block party, books a different food truck to show up every week. They grab the food from the food truck, then go to their individual driveways and eat it, and we socialize together. Saddleback uh, Student Ministries has made note cards available for students to fill out and put them on their neighbor's doorstep, get feedback on how they can help their neighbor. Uh, uh, Michelle uh, uh, wrote, says, we make greeting cards with star star Starbucks gift cards and Saddleback information put in them. We take photos of the chalk art and we send them around to different people. We did an outdoor movie screen and on and on, just different ways. Let me ask you, are you an encourager or are you a discourager? What would people say? Are you, do you give more compliments or do you give more criticisms? Do you give more strokes or do you give more pokes? Here's how you do the second most important command in life. You get to know your neighbor individually and you start encouraging them continually. Encourage my neighbors continually. Here's the third thing you can do. I need to serve my neighbors cheerfully. I need to learn how to serve my neighbors cheerfully. That means meet the different needs, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, practical needs, whatever they need. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, each of you has been blessed by God with many wonderful gifts. And what are those gifts for? You've been blessed by many wonderful gifts by God to be used to serve those around you. So use your gifts well in serving others. That's 1 Peter. You see, God has given you talents, gifts, abilities, skills, background, and all of those things weren't given for your benefit. They're given for the benefit of others. Your gift is for the benefit of others, and other people's gift is for the benefit of you. For instance, God has gifted me as a teacher, not to bless me, to bless you. My gift is for your benefit. Your gift is for my benefit. But attitude is incredibly important. I said, serve your neighbors cheerfully. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, serve the Lord cheerfully. Not as a grouch, not as a grump, not complaining about it. Oh, I need to go serve my neighbors. Jesus said, if you want to be great, you learn to be the servant of all. Now, meeting needs and helping and serving other people is how we show love. It is love in action. 1 John 3, 17. If we have what we need, the Bible says, 1 John 3, 17, if we have what we need and we see other people in need, but we turn a cold shoulder and we do nothing about it, then the love of God is not in us. It's not in us. We're just faking it. Now at Saddleback, we have practiced for 40 years what I call the you're it principle. You see a need, you're it. <laughs> you're the answer. People come to me and say, uh, you know, Rick, we see this need. Uh, I think the church should do something about it. I say, great, you're it, go for it. If you see the need, you're it. Get to know my neighbor personally. Encourage my neighbor continually serve my neighbor cheerfully. Let me read you some of the innovative ways people have been serving their neighborhoods by our members in, in, uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, one woman wrote, anytime I go to the grocery store, I first check with my neighbors to see if they need anything. This has given me many opportunities to chat with my neighbors about Christ. Uh, here's a guy who says, I offer to mow all my neighbor's lawn during this crisis. Um, 
we offered to wash our neighbor's car, a uh, couple wrote, uh, our cars and all that. One says, food always opens doors. I've been cooking meals and taking to my neighbors since the pandemic began. All right. Now here it says, our family has pulled weeds for Jesus in our neighborhood. <laughs> weeds for Jesus. Here's a guy who wrote, we shop for our neighbors who need to stay home. We make a Costco trip for the whole street. They make a Costco trip for the whole street. I want to live on your street, okay? Uh, here's another one. When I go to Costco or Smart and Final, I ask people if they can pick some up. So here's one. Gina wrote, we bought donuts for everybody on our block and gave them out. Now that's service, all right? And I told you about the couple that, that passed out board games to everybody. Um, so there's just so many different ways to serve. Let me read you. Here, I offer to help with any outdoor project that people need. Here's another one that said, we text our neighbor whenever we're going anywhere. We offer to pick up whatever items, especially for those neighbors who are uh, over 65 or vulnerable, need to stay inside. Here says, uh, every, here's another Costco. Obviously, Saddleback finances Costco, okay? When we go to Costco, we always have more than we can use, so we started sharing everything we've got with our neighbors. You know, you buy, who really needs a 100-pound jar of pickles? You can, you can pass those around, all right? Uh, our entire family calls our neighborhood and offers to help them with outdoor chores, lawn, garbage cans, get mail, etc. all right? Here's one, she said, we get our neighbor's text number so we can text them anytime we're at a store and say, do you need anything? You know, just maybe you thought of it just right then. Instead of just food, we drop off needed supplies at a, at a neighbor's doorstep, like gloves, toilet paper, disinfectant spray, wipes. Here's another guy who says, we've been running errors, errands for our neighborhood since we are both out of work. We have plenty of time. Here said, here's one said, we posted a QR code on our neighborhood's mailbox, on their boxes, neighborhood mailboxes, to join a group for support during COVID. Brilliant. Brilliant. Here's another one says, we use the next door app to let our neighbors know that we're there, we're there to help. And here's a woman who wrote, we pick up groceries for our neighbors, but this is important. We're also equally intentional in asking for their help at times. Because sometimes it's just as encouraging to let someone feel needed as it is to meet a need. That's brilliant. You get that? Sometimes you need to serve them, but sometimes you need to ask to let them serve you. Then they feel needed. And they feel wanted. And, and doing that. Here's another. We bake cookies given our neighbors. Then we add a contact information on the card, deliver it with the baked goods. Here's another guy who said, we did a neighborhood car wash in our cul-de-sac. We all washed at the same time. Here's the, we get the mail for every elderly neighbor in our neighborhood. We get the mail. Here's a guy who said, I, I pick up the newspapers that are out on the thing and, on, and each day take them up to their porch just to help them out. We pick them up for older, older people. So you can see these are just, the sky is the limit on getting to know your neighbors, on encouraging your neighbors, and on serving your neighbors. Serve them cheerfully. Here's the fourth way scripture talks about. Well, it doesn't specifically talk about this, but it does talk about bringing them to church. Invite my neighbors. Here's the fourth way you can love your neighbor. Invite my neighbors to watch online. Invite my neighbors to watch church online. You say, now Rick, there is no verse in the Bible about online church. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. But Jesus told a parable to explain the importance of bringing people to God's family. And in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, then the master said, listen to this, I want you to go out everywhere. I want you to go out everywhere people are, to the highways and to the hedges, and urge anyone you can find to come into my house so that my house will be full. That's a direct quote. God wants a full house. Now, of course, right now, most of the church houses all around the world are shut down from this pandemic. Well, that's okay. We, we now have technology. We can invite people to join us online, just like you're watching this service online right now. In fact, did you know that more people are more open 
right now to an invitation to a church service than at any other point in our entire lifetime. People are hungry for the truth. In the first place, there's no competition. There's no sports. You can't go to the beach. You, 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 there's a lot of stuff you can't do. You can't go to the movie theaters. So people are hungry. They're hungry for truth. They're hungry for meaning. They're hungry for hope. They're hungry for purpose. They're hungry for comfort. They're hungry for wisdom. They're hungry for God. This is the time of all times you should be inviting people to watch online. You know, I read a survey this week that said that during this pandemic, 53% of all young people, 53% of all people under 35 years of age have gone online and watched a church service during this pandemic. That's amazing. This is the generation that's supposed to say, I've, I've given up on church. But over half, 53% of the people under 35 have on their own gone online and watched a church service because they feel a need in their heart for spiritual maturity and spiritual depth and spiritual food. Now, I really don't need to say much about this to you who are members of Saddleback Church because you are the best inviters on the planet. Nobody does a better job with you. I want to share some exciting statistics with you, some, some, some information, some facts that's going to encourage you about your church. In the, in the 10 weeks, uh, of the first 10 weeks of 2020, when we didn't have the COVID-19 shutdown, in that first 10 weeks, of our church averaged on the weekend about 45,000 people in attendance. About 30,000 came to all of our campuses and about 15,000 watched online. So between coming to church uh, to a service and our campus and watching online, about 45,000 uh, people were, were participating in a Saddleback service every week before COVID hit. In all of the weeks since, since the COVID hit and we've shut down, in online only, we have been averaging over 100,000 in attendance. More than double. Why? Because you're inviting your friends. You're telling your neighbors. You are telling your neighbors to watch online. And our attendance has doubled while we've been shut down because you are inviting people to watch. Have you, have you invited anybody? Have you invited anybody? Have you told anybody? You ought to check out Saddleback. There's a guy who stands out in his field in the middle of a farm, but he's teaching how to handle the dis-ease of the crisis every week. That's just attendance. How about small groups? When we started this year, 2020, January 1, we had Saddleback had over 6,000 small groups meeting. All right? We're the largest small group church uh, in America. We have more people in small groups than have come on the weekend. And, and, and so we had 6,000 small groups. Since COVID-19 started and we were shut down, we've started over 3,000 more small groups. We now have 9,023 small groups at Saddleback. That's unheard of. It's just unheard of. And, and, and those groups are now meeting online because when they said we can't even meet in homes, well, we did. Now, when we actually start opening up again, and you're going to hear stories of churches opening up, listen, Saddleback will be one of the later ones to open up because we're so big. I, we're, we don't resent this that little churches, small churches can open before we do, that's fine. We're happy for them. There'll be the small churches and the medium churches, then the large churches, and then the last things to open will be Saddleback and Disneyland, you know, where there's, uh, you know, tens of thousands. Uh, but since we went online, over 9,000 small groups, we will go back to church in the home as soon as we're able to. And we've got 9,000 little churches meeting in homes, okay? Now, let me give you another statistic. Since we have been online, we haven't met, listen, four, over 4,400 people have been saved. Over 4,400 people have given their lives to Christ since we stopped meeting. Why? Because Saddleback has said all along, we're far more than a weekend service. 
That didn't shut us down, it just shut down weekend service. We've been doing more than ever before. I've been working 20, 20 hours, uh, sometimes 20 hour days and sometimes 12 hour days, sometimes 18 hour days. Why? Because over 2,200 people have come to Christ through our ministries and over 2,200 people have come to Christ through our online services. Why? Because you're inviting them to our online services. You're amazing. You, you people are amazing. Our church is the most amazing church. I, I don't know anything like it. Your giving has remained constant. In fact, giving is higher than it was. And that has allowed us to help tens of thousands of families out of work. We're feeding literally tens of tens of thousands of families. And the school districts are coming to us. We're working with four or five different school districts. The Board of Supervisors are coming to us. They just recently asked us to do a, 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 a distribution pop-up for food at Mile uh, Square a Park, and they're expected 1,000 cars just at that one. So invite people to, to a service. That's how you show your neighbor your love. Invite them to, to watch online, and then afterwards invite them to discuss it. And the talk it over questions, I send them to you every week in the mail. If you're on the mailing list, you get those, you can do it. So let's review. How do I love my neighbor's self? Remember, this is about action. It's not about, oh, that was a nice message and I'm not gonna do anything. What are you gonna do this week? You're gonna get to know your neighbors personally, one way or the other. Number two, you're gonna encourage your neighbors continually. Number three, you're gonna serve your neighbors cheerfully. At number four, you're gonna invite your neighbors to watch online church as one more, and this is the most important one of all. Share Christ personally. Share Christ with my neighbors personally. You need to learn how to explain to your neighbor how they can become friends with Jesus. It's not that hard, friends. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. You build a bridge of love between your heart and there with like a barbecue and you let Jesus walk across. And you share with them that their past can be forgiven, that they can have a purpose for living, that they can have a home in heaven. You know the greatest gift you can give your neighbor, the greatest gift you can do your neighbor, give your neighbor, the greatest way you can love your neighbor is introduce them to the God who loves people the God who loves them. God loves everybody. He wants everybody to know Jesus. God has never made a person he doesn't love. And we must care because God cares. Everybody needs Jesus. Love needs no choice. To love your neighbors yourself is you do everything possible that they go to heaven and not hell. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 says this, always, always be prepared to give an answer Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But, he says, do this with gentleness and respect. You don't need to be a salesman. You don't need to be attorney. You don't need to be in a defense lawyer. The most loving thing you can do is just say, here's what Jesus Christ has done for me. And you tell them about Jesus. Notice it says, be ready to answer. You know what? That means that involves words. Be ready to answer. I mean, I've heard people say, well, I don't ever talk about Jesus because my witness is my life. Sorry, that's not good enough. Even Jesus had to explain it, and he was perfect, and you're not. Even Jesus had to explain the good news of forgiveness, the good news that God has a purpose for your life, the good news that God loves you, and he'll never stop loving you. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Christ's love compels us. Now, here's an amazing fact. I just told you that we've had about 4,400 people come to Christ in just in the time since the COVID virus started. And about half of those have come to Christ through the food pantries. They drive up in a car and they roll down their window and we ask them what they need and we give them the food. And then somebody says, have you ever heard of, uh, of Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I've heard of him. Do you, do, is, do you have a friendship with him? Well, I don't know. Well, we'd like to introduce you to Christ. And 2,200 people since this environment start, this crisis started, those people, those 2,200 people have never had, uh, most of those people had never led anybody to Christ at all. Never led a person to Christ. 
but it's all one-on-one, -on -one, sharing through a window. I want you to have the joy and the privilege of leading somebody to accept Christ. I don't want you to get to heaven one day and Jesus say, who are you bringing with you? And you go, oh, I didn't take time, or I was an introvert, or I never learned how, or I never took advantage. These people who have led those 2,200 people to Christ are doing it at the food bank pop-ups and led to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. And most of those people had never led anybody to Christ. This week I heard about Emily. Emily was scared to death. She, she, she was scared to death, but she became a believer. And she said, I wanna help out at the, at the food center. And she watched other people, and this is what we do. We'll put you with somebody as they lead somebody to Christ, standing there, and you just watch them, kind of like how a clerk trains another clerk. You watch how they do it, and after three or four cars, you go, well, I think I might be able to do that. And the first day, Emily led a person to Christ. She had never led anybody to Christ, scared to death. But then all of a sudden, once it happens, it's addicting. It's in your blood. It's better than any kind of drug. Yesterday, Emily led 14 people to Christ personally. She's 21 years old. If you have never led anybody to Christ, I want you to experience that joy this week. It's like fishing out of a bucket, okay? And so I wanna give you two opportunities to learn how to share your life with Christ, share Christ with others. First, you can serve in a food distribution. As I said, cars will pull up. This week, we're, we're at least 1,000 cars a day in different places in Southern California, and they pull up. And, and if you say, I would like to learn how to share my faith, and I, I don't wanna go to heaven without having led somebody to Christ, then I want you to write the word serve, text serve to 99,000. Text me, serve to 99,000, and we'll sign you up to help us in one of the, the food pop-ups. If you, if you live uh, outside of uh, uh, this area or you don't have a texting, you can email me, serve at saddleback.com. One word, serve, text it to 99,000, serve at saddleback.com. And, and, and we'll get you involved. You'll lead somebody to Christ this week. It's not that hard. It's very easy. Second thing you can do is you can take a one hour class online this week. And if you wanna be a part of that class, you can also text SERVE uh, at 99,000 and, and we'll sign you up for that one hour class uh, to help you understand how you, your friends around you are waiting to be saved during this pandemic. Think about this, 4,400 people saved in, the t in this short time period. That's more than any other period in the history of Saddleback Church in this little bit amount of time. God has never made a person he didn't love, and they're more open to it right now. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish. Now let me end by telling you what my dream is for our church. My dream, my dream for our church is that our church is known for doing these five things. That we did these five things during the COVID-19 pandemic. That these five qualities are what compose our reputation in our communities. That this is what we're famous for. I want people to be able to say, you know, that church, Saddleback Church, that's the church where everybody's a good neighbor. If you live next to somebody who's a member of Saddleback Church, you are so lucky because Saddleback members are the very best neighbors in the world. They don't complain, they don't gripe, they don't fight. They're amazing good neighbors. I envy you that you live by a Saddleback member because they're always so encouraging and they're always so cheerful and they always make me feel better and they always make me feel more hopeful you won't find a more encouraging group of people than those Saddleback members. And they always notice what you need when you need something and, and, and they're quick to meet that need and they're so unselfish. This is my dream that people will say this about you. They're just so unselfish. They don't just take care of each other in that church. They take care of anybody, anybody who needs that any kind of love. And they're so generous and sharing whatever they have, it just blows me away. And, and they included me, uh, their neighbor, and they invited me to all their fun stuff. 
So I started watching the service, the church service online. And you know what? That Pastor Rick, that guy makes sense. I, I feel like I can relate to him. I feel like he would like me as much as I like him. I do. I do. He doesn't talk down to you. It's just a conversation about life and, and God and relationships. And it makes a lot of sense. And you know what? I wanted what my neighbor had. And they helped me get to know Jesus. And now I'm a part of God's family. And I don't feel alone anymore. And I have a new confidence. And I have a new strength. And now I'm going to be friends with my neighbors forever in heaven. That's what I want our church known for. Now, if you have never met Jesus Christ in a personal way, or maybe you heard about him, maybe you've gone to church, maybe you never went to church, you may be asking, why would anybody put so much effort into showing love to other people, the neighbors on their street? The answer is this. We love because Jesus first loved us. And when you are loved by Jesus and you feel his love, you can't help but love other people. If you've heard about Jesus, but you don't have a friendship with him yet, uh, let me read you one last verse from the Bible because it's my prayer for you. Ephesians chapter three, verses 17 and 18. This is a verse in the Bible. It says this, this is my prayer for you. I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart living within you as you trust him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel how long and how wide and how deep and how high his love really is. And may you experience this love for yourselves. That's the starting point. Now today I want to invite you to do two things. First, I want to invite you to experience God's love for yourself personally. And second, I want to invite you to become a part of this family of believers called Saddleback Church. Would you bow your heads with me and let me pray with you and for you. Father, we know that without love, nothing really matters nothing else matters. We know that to love others is our number one responsibility in life. Help us to not just talk about love, not to just listen to a sermon about love, but to really act in loving ways this week, today, tomorrow, with our neighbors and our spouses and our children and those we work with and those we don't even know, strangers and those who don't know you. Help us all to grow in love for each other pray that our family will, church family will overflow with love and that everybody will find acceptance and encouragement and forgiveness. Help us to feel and to understand and experience your love so deeply that we have to share it with others and we offer it to others and help us to show practical love to our neighbors this week. Now you pray. You say, dear Jesus Christ, I want to know you. Dear Jesus Christ, I want to feel your love. I don't understand it all, but I open my life to your love. Change my life. Make it better. Save me by your love. I want to learn your purpose for my life, the purpose that I was created for. And I want to be a part of your family forever, not just here on earth, but in heaven. So I humbly ask you to accept me into your life and into your family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, would you tell me about it? Every week at the end of the service, we commit our, recommit our lives to Jesus. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, text me, new start, that's just one word, text new start to 99,000. And I will send you some material to help you with your decision. You'll be one of those 4,400 people who during COVID-19 stepped across the line and entered the family of God. New start at 99,000 or email me newstart at saddleback.com. The other thing we do is we express our gratitude to God 
for all of his goodness to us. We do that by giving back to him. And you can do that by giving online. You know, your generosity, I don't need to say this, but every week your generosity online is feeding tens of thousands of -of out-of-work people. And it's serving the needs of others too. You can go to saddleback.com slash give and you could give there. You can actually set up an online account to be giving on a regular basis, helping feed thousands and tens of thousands of people out of work. Now, if you want to learn how to lead somebody to Christ, you want to sign up to serve at one of our 50 pop-up food distributions this week, text serve at 99,000 or email me serve at saddleback.com. I love you. I'll be praying for you this week. Love your neighbors, yourself, and we'll get back together next weekend. God bless you, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. If you accepted Christ today, let us know. Text the word New Start to 99000. That's one word, New Start to 99000. Or you could email newstart at saddleback.com to give an offering of gratitude to God for his goodness in your life and to help feed tens of thousands of out of work families. Go over to saddleback.com slash give and to serve at one of our pop-up food distribution centers and learn how to share your faith in Jesus, just text the word SERVE to 99000 or you can email serve at saddleback.com. One more thing, don't forget about our Together Tuesday events. All of our campuses host these on Zoom every single Tuesday. Head over to your campus website for more information. Have a good week, everybody. See you next time.